Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Contemporary Elder Sophroni of Essex says in one of his writings, when he's speaking to Metropolitan Orotheus, that through humility alone we are saved, and through pride alone are we destroyed. This seems like a very simple point. It seems like maybe a little too to, to the point for some of us, but it's true. It's absolutely true, because the humble heart receives God, and the prideful one God departs from. When Elder Ambrosio of Optino was asked at the end of his life what prayer rule he had kept throughout his life by his disciples, he said, just the rule of the public, and God be merciful to me, a sinner. Now, of course, that's not the only prayer that he ever said. He said many other prayers, certainly the Jesus prayer frequently. But the point was, he prayed with humility. He prayed that God would be merciful to him, because he was a sinner. And then there's a story in the lives of the saints from Abba Pacomius. And Abba Pacomius held a meeting of the desert elders one time, and they were all giving a word, but one of them never said anything. He said, Abba, why is it that you aren't saying anything? And he said, Abba, I have seen my own sins, therefore I am silent. Apparently all of us have not seen our own sins, because most of us are not very silent. We talk about things as if we were the Pharisee. We had all these great works and great deeds. But this one elder really got it. Not that there are other things to say, not that there are important things to preach and to say, as long as it's to the glory of God. But he got it, the humility. And in this passage today, this famous passage, of course, which we all know, we have heard in the service last night many times, that not only we are to emulate the publican in his humility, we were to emulate the Pharisee in his good works. These weren't bad things. They also told us in the hymns last night to reject the pride of the Pharisee, but to reject the evil defilement of the publican. They both had things for us to learn, but the primary focus, of course, is on this tremendous humility of the publican. Now you remember from last week about Zacchaeus, and Zacchaeus, of course, was a not a good man in the eyes of the world. He was a man who extorted money from everyone, but he repented with profound humility. It would have been the same with this man today. This was a man that people wouldn't have enjoyed having come into their presence in the temple. This was a man who bought his way into this position, and a man who did everything he could to tear apart old widows' homes and everybody that was downtrodden to take everything away from them that he could by extortion. He prayed on the weak. But he could see his sins. And as many of the fathers say, it's better to be a sinner who knows that he's a sinner and to be repentant than to be one who's never committed any sins and to be prideful about it. And this Pharisee in the passage today, of course, is not a terrible man. By any stretch of the imagination, outwardly in the eyes of the world, he's very great. Not only did he have an important position amongst the clergy, but he, but he did all the right things. He kept the fast twice in the week, which is precisely why we don't keep the fast this week, to show that we are not like him and to humble ourselves a little bit. He also gave tithes. He kept the commandments. He wasn't a bad man, but he attributed these things to himself, which was the danger. Elder Emilianos says that it seems like he didn't need a savior. He thought that his works, by his works, he deserved something from God. I deserve some special gift, some special rewards, because look at all the things that I do. When he should have been doing those things anyway, but be doing them out of humility, be doing them from a place of, of need, from a place of desire to love the one who saved him, that came in profound humility to save us, that gave everything he had to save us by abasing himself to death on the cross, to be spat upon, and to whip, and to be whipped, and put a crown of thorns upon his head. He showed us this path. He showed us the way to salvation by abasing himself even into the depths of Hades for us. It is that path we follow into paradise. Boy, this amazes me. I think I hear it more and more as the years go along. I have to attribute that somewhat to the state of the society where 
as I've mentioned many times, the state of our society is one of complete comfort and fatness in everything, whether it's homes or cars or food or whatever it is we do. Absolute indulgence. But I constantly hear from people, I don't understand, Father, why I'm suffering from this. I don't understand, Father, why this had to happen to my family member. As if somehow we were perfect. As if somehow there were no sins in the world. And if somehow God did not know what he was doing in chastising us and bringing us to repentance and giving us potential crowns in the kingdom of heaven beside that, why should I have to go through these things? It is as if we deserve something special from God. Of course, we get something extremely special from God. We get salvation in the kingdom of heaven. But it is not because we are deserving of it. Elder Ambrose, who was perfect in the eyes of the world, could say that his rule was, God, be merciful to me, a sinner, because these weren't words to him. He believed that. And the tonality of our prayer, all of our prayers must be one of humility and one who needs a Savior. When we enter into our prayers every night and every morning, into the divine liturgy, they can't be simply mechanical by saying these words, which, yes, have meaning, but how can we dare say, have mercy on me, or God be merciful to me, a sinner, when we don't believe it, or we don't act like it? One who has fallen short of the glory of God is in desperate need of a Savior. That is why we cry out, have mercy on me, have mercy on me, a sinner. And we should believe it, because we desperately do need his presence in our lives. We do need to be that man who keeps his eyes down because we are not worthy of the exalted things of paradise. We need to realize that. But the danger, I think, more than anything I see now is how people make such light things of their sins. It's, I don't do much, Father. Just a little thing. The same thing I always do. Well, I just broke the fast. Not a big deal. Everybody does it. Fasting will keep us out of paradise. Remember that. I don't didn't say my prayers last night, but you know, I say them most nights. Not a big deal. I, you know, just got mad at somebody in traffic. Everybody does it. Remember, a piece of fruit lost us paradise. Anything that's not to the glory of God is sin. So when we say, I believe, O oh Lord, and I confess and thou art true that Christ the Son of the living God who came into the world to say sinners of whom I am first or chief. We must believe that. It mustn't just be words. We can't say, I thank thee, Lord, that I am not like these other people. I do these things pretty well. I'm not like that guy that's in prison. I'm not like that person who committed adultery. I'm not like that person who killed. I'm not like that person who's angry and bitter all the time and gossips. Because maybe it's not that sin that's going to remove me from the kingdom of heaven, but my will, whatever I take with me in my heart that is opposed to God, is my idolatry, will be the thing that separates me from the kingdom of God. The Lord tells us to be perfect, for my Father in heaven is, in, is perfect. Are we ever achieve that problem? We not, most of us, but it needs to be our effort. It needs to be the effort of our life to realize that we have fallen short of the glory of God and to realize we need the Savior's help most desperately to be able to cry out, Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me. We have to be able to do that. We have to be able to obey us ourselves. We have to be able to take ourselves down to realize that everything we see others doing around us, whether it be like that publican, as he said, is the thing that's going to take me down. Except for the grace of God, as Dorotheus of Gaza says, there I go to. There is no sin that anyone has ever committed that each and every one of us is not capable of at some point at our weakest point and given the right opportunity or the wrong opportunity as it may be. So we can't look at anyone and say, I would never do that. We can't look at anyone and think, oh, this is no big deal. Our pride ultimately is what sin is going to kill us. Our pride is what is taking us away from the kingdom of heaven to think that we know better somehow than everyone else outside of the way of the church. The way of the church is the only way. The 
way of the church is the one of humility. The way of the church and his teachings are the products of those who have humbled themselves and received the Holy Spirit. So lest we think that all these distractions don't mean anything, lest we think that it's just not a big deal what I'm doing, the Pharisee did everything right. He had too much pride. The publican did virtually nothing right. But he had humility. And what we need to do is combine those two. That's the way of the saints. To do the commandments of God, to show forth our love for God, but to do it in profound humility. And to remember that way that Elder Sophroni tells us, through humility alone we are saved, through pride alone we are destroyed. Amen. Thank you.